Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's two after, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. I'm Callan Steinman. I'm Curator of Education at the Georgia Museum of Art, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's curator talk um, about the exhibition Inside Look, um, uh, Selected Acquisitions from the Georgia Museum of Art. And we're going to be hearing from um, Dr. Shania Harris, who's our Thompson Curator of African American Art. And she's going to be sharing about selections from the Femfolio Portfolio portfolio, which is on view in the exhibition currently. So I'm going to hand it over to Shania and we'll, and if you have questions for her that come up at any time during the presentation, go ahead and put those in the Q&A, but we are going to hold questions until the end. So thank you for being with us, Shania. Can't wait to hear about this section of the show. Thanks, Callan. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, today, December the 1st, beginning of the holiday season, or at least a continuation of the holiday season, um, to talk about this section from our inside look, selected acquisitions from the Georgia Museum of Art, um, uh, the Femfolio portfolio, which is a portfolio of prints um, produced all around um, 2007 um, by the Brodsky Center um, for um, printmaking. And um, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the works that are in our Inside Look um, exhibition um, focus on maybe underrepresented areas um, of uh, a lot of major American collections, um, in particularly in the area of women artists, um, African American artists, Native artists, um, and, and, for, and for our purposes, the addition of uh, a lot of um, photography, contemporary art, and that expansion at our museum. And so we thought it was quite fitting to put this portfolio on display um, showing the works by 12, um, I mean, excuse me, by 20 different um, women artists. So just to kind of give you a little bit more background, I mentioned it was um, produced really um, around uh, 2006, 2007 that the works themselves were actually produced. Uh, it was published around 2009, so, you know, made into kind of like an official portfolio uh, made available. And there was only a 60 um, editions, um, uh, 60, um, yeah, it's a 60 edition um, portfolio, meaning there's only 60 portfolios like it in the world. So it's pretty unique um, that we have it as a part of our collection to add to um, our set or a suite of women artists. So it was kind of at, when, at the time that we purchased um, the portfolio, I had heard about it in the past and several collections, including the Museum of Modern Art um, and others and other uh, university collections included this. And I said, well, this is a great way for us to add women artists um, to our collection, um, but all at one time um, through this suite of prints. Um, they're all 12 by 12, so any of you have uh, visited the museum, um, and by the way, the show, the entire exhibition of Inside Look is um, up until January 30th, uh, 2022, so if you get past Christmas and you haven't seen it, um, you should stop in before the end of January. They're all 12 by 12 size prints, so they're all kind of uniform in size if you go to the galleries. And again, it's 20 different artists. In our case, it's only 19 artists, um, in part because, oh, I gotta pr proceed. Uh, because once we, uh, one uh, print is missing and we just have it on included as an image on a label and that is um, a work by um, artist Emma Amos, because this work is um, on tour for our Emma Amos Color Odyssey exhibition that exhibited at the end of um, this uh, of January of this year, and is now um, exhibiting at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So a little personal plug, that exhibition will be up, I believe until January the 17th of, um, so until next, uh, next month. So that's the only missing print um, from the portfolio, um, but we've kind of represented it a little bit um, in, through, a, through one of our labels, but the other 19 artists are on exhibit at our museum. So I'm going back a little bit, sorry about that. So just to kind of give you um, a sense um, of the content, 
there's a lot of um, areas of content for the Femfolio portfolio because it's a kind of a broad swath of women artists, um, also a broad swath of styles. Uh, some women who may have primarily been painters, performance artists, um, other types of conceptual art or installation art, um, sculpt uh, sculptors, you name it. So being able to integrate them all in the area of printmaking, I'm sure was a bit of a task, um, but at the same time, it's a great way to kind of see some of the themes and ideas that they were, they were circulating um, in various segments of their careers or their primary mode of operating in terms of content and um, ideas through the printmaking medium. So just a little quick um, aside about the Brodsky Center. Um, the Brodsky Center uh, was founded as the Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper in 1986. So at Rutgers University, um, you know, which has a strong arts program. In fact, Emma Amos, who I just mentioned, was a professor at Rutgers University for several years and a chairperson. Um, they had this uh, Center for Innovative Print and Paper um, that was formed in the 80s. The founding director was Judith Brodsky, who was a pro also a professor of art at Rutgers University. So she would have known someone like Amos and a few other artists that um, actually are in this suite of prints who were professors of art um, at that university. And the Brodsky Center did a variety of editions. So they did over 300 and have done over 300 editions of uh, printmaking projects with various artists, uh, emerging artists, established artists, uh, master printmakers, um, emerging printmakers, um, different types of paper media um, or different types of printmaking methods from lithography to etching and so forth. Uh, one of the things that they've done over the years is to have an artist in residence program. And that's um, in part how they were able to create um, various editions of uh, prints. Uh, in 2006, um, the uh, Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper was renamed to the Brodsky Center, um, or in honor of Brodsky. Um, in 2018, um, joined the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts um, in Philadelphia, where the Brodsky Center continues to this day. So it's now affiliated with the um, Pennsylvania Academy of uh, Fine Arts. But anyway, just to kind of give you an idea about uh, the art of um, feminism, many people have been familiar with the Guerrilla Girls, um, sorry about that misspelling, um, and some of the posters that they created back in the late 1980s, 1990s. In fact, we had an exhibit based on the Guerrilla Girls um, many years ago um, at our um, museum. And the idea of equity in the arts, the idea of women being able to create and also be included into um, collections, um, that's always been and continues to be an issue. Um, in fact, in part, one of the reasons why we wanted to include the Femfolio um, portfolio in our collection. And so this is kind of demonstrative of the kind of um, activism uh, that started particularly in the 60s uh, with second wave feminism and, um, you know, through the feminist movement. I mentioned Emma Amos already. Um, and just in terms of talking about um, feminism and uh, in, in feminist art, in the inclusion of diverse um, artists, not only in terms of um, not only in terms of um, art, art making, but also in terms of the background of the artists, women of color, um, even in some cases, men, uh, male artists who were sensitive to feminist causes. Um, all of these things kind of um, come through uh, in the feminist art movement. Um, this particular image by Amos called Identity was one of the earliest um, works by the um, in the Femfolio portfolio produced. Um, and Amos would have, I think she would have actually, if she hadn't recently retired, she would have still, yeah, she actually had recently retired. I'm sorry, um, my memory temporarily escaped me um, from Rutgers University. And then she produced this print um, that kind of catalogs all of her particular interest as an artist, 
She was a painter, she was a printmaker herself, as well as a weaver. And, um, you know, often used a lot of imagery and symbolic, um, symbolic kind of icons in many of her works. A lot of her work also dealt with the idea of mixed race ancestry, her own, as well as the whole idea of race as being fluid um, and not limited uh, to people's perceptions. And all of that being tied in with her as a woman and as an artist. So you can kind of see this uh, dual nature that she takes on and all of the other imagery that's located in her hair as a site for uh, diversity, if you will, of her as an artist and all of the ideas that often emanated through her works. And, you know, you have, a, you know, a range of, um, you know, media, but also a range of um, individuals like Sophia Slay, who um, often examined the uh, kind of these, the, the notion of gender in particular, uh, its fluidity. Um, so with Amos, uh, racial um, hybridity and fluidity, but also in this case, um, the mutability, if you will, in some senses of gender, and also this whole idea of who gets pictured and how they're um, imagined um, by the viewer. Um, so this is called Douglas, Douglas John and Mrs. Smith. And so we're not sure who, if it's the cat, <laughs> um, or if it's the human being, if this is a woman or if this is a man, uh, you can see, for example, the long hair, which is often associated with women, although not always the case being women, but, you know, just kind of this coiffed hair. But then you can see the faint um, trace of facial hair, beard, mustache. So Douglas John and Mrs. Smith um, deals with this whole idea of um, kind of these borders that we create with um, when it comes to gender and how those can be mutable. We have other artists such as Miriam Shapiro, um, who were pioneers in the feminist art movement. Um, Miriam Shapiro is often associated with a Canadian um, artist uh, that was active in California, um, helped establish a space called Women's Space, which was a performance and arts um, oriented center uh, that championed feminist causes. Um, uh, among other things. And her work often revolved around um, pattern and decoration. In fact, she was considered to be a pioneer of a movement called the pattern and decoration movement that was kind of anti the establishment, established art of the time, um, which past 1950 early on, there was an emphasis on abstract art, but then this kind of heroic male uh, sensibility when it came to um, particularly abstract art and minimalism and how many of those works were devoid of the content of culture of um, you know identity uh, that someone like a Shapiro would have been interested in inputting into those works and oftentimes decoration or anything of a decorative nature uh, was associated with being feminine you know, anything like flowers or lace or patterns. Um, it was either associated with being feminine and, and de relegated to the domestic sphere and not the outside or external world, or it was considered to be something that was of a cultural, um, you know, of, of, of a non-Western culture or, uh, or more specifically non-white European cultural makeup. And so a lot of her works um, tend to draw from um, other, you know, maybe patterns um, or decorative arts that are international um, in their reach. So you can kind of see that um, from the background that you have here. She also uh, wanted to incorporate craft in her work. Craft was often seen as anti-art. It was considered as almost feminine um, domestic arts rather than seeing it as something that could be employed for a variety of um, uses. So you can see here in this print called Court Jester, it mimics um, some of the works that um, she created um, 
you know, in other times um, where you can see this kind of lace bordered, you know, this almost like house like frame, but then you can also see even around this court jester that has all the, 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 the stars um, and this other kind of architectural framework um, that there are all these figures that possibly represent different cultures, um, Asian cultures, um, you know, maybe other parts of um, your, and, and also both high and low forms. So you have, you know, in, um, you know, maybe uh, this, the idea of bringing in a Raggedy Ann doll uh, as, a, uh, as an indication um, of another, uh, another type of art or craft um, element, but in a popular sense. So this whole idea of bringing high and low art together, of bringing other cultures in, of incorporating the decorative um, into a sensibility around art shows up in this print. And then we have um, other artists like Mae Stevens. And um, it is interesting too, um, as I was putting the slideshow together that a lot of the um, artists that are featured, they just recently passed away. And there's been um, kind of a reckoning um, with uh, incorporating women artists, particularly women of artists that came of age during the feminist, the second wave of the feminist uh, movement and um, feminist art where you know, they're now passing away and, and, and scholars and curators are starting to reconsider their careers and reincorporate um, them into the discourse around um, art of the late 20th century and even into the 21st century. Many artists like Emma Amos and Mae Stevens were, um, who, who had been active often have influenced um, a lot of the women artists and not just women artists, but a lot of artists of the current um, of the current era, so it's quite quite telling that we're, you know, able to kind of look and reflect on their careers, but unfortunately, many of them are now moved on uh, and passed away, recently. Um, this is Mae Stevens, the band that played on, I mean, the the band played on of 2007, um, and here, you know, almost in a kind of uh, whimsical sense, she's. Uh, incorporating these um, images of, you know, skeletal images of a band. Um, and, you know, there's like a little boat or raft, there's a little candle. Um, and then these figures that are performers or a part of the performance, there's a drummer in the background. So, um, you know, in some cases, there's a kind of veritas, I mean, vanitas element and um, many of the works in this uh, portfolio, not only are dealing with identity in life, but also the sensibility of mortality, of being mortal, of being human. Um, you know, that, that you know, humanity does come to an end or people's lives do come to an end. So in the rest of this portfolio, you also see other artists who explore the idea of aging, um, the idea of death, um, whether one's own death or death based on violence or other things occurring in society. So Faith Ringgold um, is another artist uh, who's actually embar embarking on um, a major retrospective um, exhibition, um, much like Amos, uh, that'll be coming up soon. And a lot of Faith Ringgold's career has revolved around her interest in storytelling and narrative. So what I've described so far is kind of reactions to various art movements like modernism, um, the aspect of identity, um, and for her to be able to play out any of those things, whether she's using a decorative techniques or whether she's um, on decorative arts, uh, and, you know, kind of pattern and decoration movement techniques um, or craft, but she's also trying to tell a story many times uh, involving her life, but also historical themes and historical subjects and how they kind of intersect one another. So coming to Jones Road under a blood red sky, and you could actually see behind her, the only reason why I chose that image of her for the previous slide was because I, I detected that it was basically the same image 
um, as the this print. Um, but so she's obviously drawing, you know, most likely drawing from that same concept. Um, so Jones um, Road was actually the road that she lived on in Englewood, New Jersey. And this print revolves around her moving to that area from Harlem where she had been born and lived for several years, several decades um, in 1992. And indirectly it talks, of, it, it's dealing with her, the kind of the idea of integration, racial integration in terms of uh, one's uh, residents and one's um, living spaces. And so being probably one of very few, if any, African-Americans moving to that neighborhood and seeing the stairs or the uh, maybe discomfort that it may have caused some of her neighbors when she and her family moved in. Um, and you can kind of see this long kind of lonely road, which is depicting her kind of moving into the neighborhood, so to speak, to this little white house in the back. And what she also incorporates, as she does with her story quilts, which, which is something that she was known for, um, was this is this narrative um, that is connected to um, enslaved people's, um, you know, kind of almost like an underground railroad of trying to escape slavery. And um, so it's a, a, a story you can kind of read it. Uncle Nate, Uncle Tate could vanish in a flash and turn up the same way one day that they just up and walk to freedom and nobody see him go. And so she's blending that whole not idea and that narrative around emancipation of African-Americans from slavery to um, her own personal story about uh, her moving, um, you know, kind of a next generation moving to a new neighborhood where she's kind of pioneering um, in the neighborhood for racial, diversity. So we have, you know, uh, discussions about identity, um, the introduction of narrative, introduction of pattern decoration and craft um, as some major themes of many feminist artists um, in this femfolio. Uh, we have someone like Carolee Schneeman, who was a performance artist. You can see from this photograph, you know, she you know, had very interesting and colorful way of um, bringing forth themes um, in her performance art and conceptual art. And in many of her works, um, although it did, might not be as indicative here, but vaguely um, is the idea around the ideas around the body and, um, you know, ideas of um, kind of combating, you know, kind of patriarchy um, and all these systems of oppression, um, you know, through the use of the body or the body is kind of demonstrative um, of, that, um, of that whole notion. And this is called evidence. And, you know, you can vaguely um, see, you know, the, what looks like remnants of almost like body parts or bodies um, with these kind of photo montages on top of these kind of colorful abstracted uh, sequence in the background um, on top. And so this idea of evidence or remnants or pieces of uh, kind of pieces of existence, which is kind of almost a, you know, a narrative around, um, you know, the, the, the kind of destruction um, oftentimes associated with war. Some of her um, works uh, evidence an interest in kind of protesting um, war as many um, feminist artists, um, you know, maybe depicted or tried to counter, you know, the Vietnam War, maybe in the 60s and 70s, or later wars or conflicts, and centered them as kind of male dominated uh, arenas that women were often not associated with. So she gives voice to, you know, her, uh, you know, protest against violence um, and destruction in some cases. Other artists, um, you know, using um, almost a photographic medium, uh, use their bodies, their own bodies, um, to deal with issues that uh, lie in the realm of, you know, the sense of artifice um, that women often have to subject themselves to through addition of 
you know, you know, the changing of their hair, whether they wear wigs, whether they wear makeup, um, and the realities of, um, you know, one's appearance and, you know, who, what you show to the world, to the world and what you don't show to the world, uh, and the notion of image and controlling one's own image. So, you know, the first image to the, um, to the left is I make up the image of my perfection. And then the second image on the right is I make up the image of my deformity. And, you know, you can see major contrast. The first image, her face looks thinner. Her, the other image, her face looks a little fuller as though she had maybe gained some weight. Her hair is coiffed in the first image. Second image, it looks flatter and non-coiffed. And then of course, you can also see there's more bags under her eyes. Uh, her, there's almost a more of an exaggeration to her eyebrows um, that are drawn on and um, pimples, you know, things that we don't want to show the outside world, uh, anyone does, but particularly women in this whole idea of women needing to be perfect um, all the time. So we have um, Joyce Kozlov. Uh, who uh, many who also is associated um, like uh, Miriam Shapiro with the pattern and decoration movement. Um, many of her works, her earlier works, deal with pattern and decoration um, to kind of tease out ideas about um, design and um, also incorporating craft um, into her work. Then there are a lot of uh, other bodies of works that deal with, I say, cartography uh, or map making, um, where she's able to look at uh, different systems, um, whether it be political systems or systems of oppression or social systems by incorporating the use of maps um, and other imagery um, in these you know, highly elaborate designs. So maps in and of themselves, you know, are, you know, there's a whole history, you know, I mean, there's studies on maps themselves and their own, their particular designs and this idea of maps being something that we believe to be truth. You know, we look at a map and we think that maps are true and honest depictions of land masses and bodies of water, but those are also constructed. Um, and so, you know, they are designed just like many works of art are designed, even if they have elements of truth to them. And they have lots of historical information um, in them that tell us a lot about society. So this one um, is called Maui Sugar Plantation. And here she kind of maps out, um, as you will, a sugar plantation. And, you know, there's a suggestion here of you know, the idea of groups of people, you know, maybe being subjected to um, dominant systems, you know, um, particularly in the case of a sugar plantation and that maps somehow trace out these types of um, relationships um, that often seem benign to us, but they are very powerful and, um, you know, have a, a lot of significance in um, the lives of the, you know, uh, various lives. Um, likewise, um, Betsy Damon um, in Blue Hole um, deals with environmental issues and uses um, a map, uh, if you will, a map of Texas uh, to kind of, with an overlay of a body of water uh, with currents and um, also kind of a, um, you know, almost like an overhead view of trees and bodies of water uh, for her, um, you, utilizing the bodies of water was important because she felt that uh, bodies of water or water itself was the foundation for life. Um, so the idea of maybe being a shortage of water um, and many of the issues that we talk about in this current moment um, were important to her. So by superimposing this blue hole, if you will. Um, she's, um, you know, kind of layering um, this map with her important concerns um, that are of an environmental nature. And we have Joan Schneider, who's an abstractionist. And, you know, the, the history of um, abstraction oftentimes left out the voices of women, the voices of minorities, 
and um, their particular concerns. And Schneider's, um, Schneider's work, um, Angry Women, incorporates her very gestural style of abstraction uh, with the, you know, you can kind of see the lines and um, bundles of color, but also creates these almost semi-figural um, images that you can kind of make out um, if you look really close. So the gestural moves to, the gestural lines move into being actual, actually figural um, lines um, as you kind of look through it. You can kind of make out here this primordial image of, of the woman's body, almost like a Venus of Willendorf of, from ancient times. Um, you can kind of almost make out a face here. Um, you know, if you know, if we want to be, you know, really specific, you know, there's a kind of image that's suggestive of female genitalia here, um, as well as um, an outstretched hand um, and so forth. But she mentions here kind of more explicitly angry women um, and kind of this sisterhood of women across space and time who share um, the kind of, uh, this kind of uh, anger against male patriarchy, um, anger against being ignored um, or being kind of undermined historically. And again, the body is used um, again uh, in the self-portrait with the work of Joan Semmel, um, this untitled uh, work which is a self-portrait of her in the nude uh, and it's blurred out. So we don't really see her, uh, you know, there's a suggestion of anonymity in that, um, but there's also the suggestion of mutability in this kind of blurred image of her um, with the self-portrait, which apparently it, you can see that it looks like she's holding a um, camera in her hand um, to photograph herself possibly in a mirror and then we can see that action taking place. And Mary Beth Edelson, who again incorporates this, you know, this kind of almost universal theme of woman, um, like um, the earlier image of um, the Joan Snyder work, where um, the primordial joins with the contemporary woman you know, that there's something timeless with uh, femininity, something timeless about uh, the feminine um, and also something uh, that is almost supernatural um, about the, the feminine goddess uh, throughout time. And here she kind of creates her own modern day version with a kind of a, almost a shell, like, you know, being at the beach. It, this is seemingly a beach scene, like you can kind of see rock formations and, um, and then her head is transformed into um, a shell and, um, you know, she appears to be in the nude, but um, so it's a goddess head um, depicted in this particular um, print. You can also see um, in the Femfolio, by the way, that the prints are often digitally produced um, but they do still leave traces of the original medium, whether it be photography um, or whether it be some form of hand um, colored lithography. Uh, so it's kind of interesting um, how you can see the imprint of various women's, uh, the, the medium that they would normally use, like if it was a painter that they would, you know, maybe lean on um, lithography to depict the color or gestural strokes or if it was a photographer to show kind of almost the grainy texture of maybe black and white photography, or in the case of somebody like Martha Wilson, uh, to show that kind of photorealistic um, imagery, um, but through the, um, the print medium. And the Dance of Death by Eleanor Anton. Um, Anton often drawing out um, the idea of Again, the, uh, the, this kind of primordial woman or primordial human, but also depicting kind of this universal themes um, such, in, in, such as mortality, death, life and death. Here she's taking, um, 
you know, th the theme of maybe almost medieval images that she's able to draw from of battle. And she makes them all into skeletal forms. And oft oftentimes, again, the skeletal form lends itself to dealing with the subject of death or one's own mortality. And so um, also the, um, in this case, the idea of violence and its end result, which is death. And so through these kind of small cartoons of you know, these figural um, skeletal forms, she's bringing together this whole history of uh, violence, but also the, again, repeated theme of mortality and death. Um, same here with Nancy Spiro, um, this Maypole War um, image um, depicts the heads, what, what looks like heads along a maypole. So uh, some, a kind of a gory suggestion of violent death. Uh, Spiro had a, a similar, an installation um, that was based on a similar theme that was presented at the uh, Venice Biennale, a big major art, um, you know, art fair, exhibition, international um, uh, space for art, contemporary art in um, Venice, Italy. And it was based in part on, again, on this, um, these heads, you know, on these decapitated um, figures that where we were left with their heads and the violence um, of war uh, that, um, that takes place specifically in her case, this started with the idea of um, people who had uh, been murdered um, in the violent conflict in Vietnam and their heads were often um, cut off and um, actually um, kind of they were impaled, if you will. Um, they were placed on poles. But here she uses the concept of the maypole with various heads surrounding it to, you know, show kind of the frivolity in which people's lives were taken, where it was almost considered, um, you know, not really that important or almost frivolous, like dancing around a maypole. Um, so it's kind of an ironic image depicting the horrors of war. And again, other um, important figures um, who passed away in the last decade or so, June Wayne, who was a major um, figure in printmaking. Uh, she was the founder of the Tamarind uh, printmaking uh, workshop, uh, which was, and uh, she, excuse me, in New Mexico. Um, originally it was uh, founded in 1960 and then it moved to New Mexico and it still operates uh, as a, a space for printmaking innovation. Uh, and so a lot of uh, major printmaker printmaking projects have taken place through Tamarind. And this particular work, uh, Zinc Mon Amour, uh, Zinc My Love, uh, shows kind of the surface of the, um, of kind of the matrix for printmaking, you know, so kind of almost a close up image of it that's been reproduced through this digital print, uh, where, you know, it kind of suggests her love of printmaking, which is evidenced by her involvement uh, as a major figure um, in the world of printmaking. It also indicates um, to me the, um, the absence of, of credit toward women printmakers. Um, many of the uh, women that I've shown in this portfolio have had a hand in innovation of uh, major, major printmaking techniques uh, as they maybe explored them in their own work. Uh, and so June Wayne, um, giving space, being able to give space for printmaking in general um, and her contribution to that whole process uh, is, is one to kind of consider when you think about this particular work. And so, you know, we have other figures such as um, Harmony Hammond uh, with this kind of minimalist um, sensibility uh, it, but the words eulogy, you know, almost suggestive of some of the themes I talked about, like of, of mortality uh, and kind of reflecting on one's own life with this double eulogy. And Athena Tatcha, 
um, with this, uh, this lithograph, which was a two run lithograph on paper, meaning it was printed, um, it was printed twice in this kind of ball or tangled ball that almost appears to be like someone looking under a microscope at, um, you know, this kind of tangled web of, um, of material. And these are just, you know, I'm just showing just a few. I know we're probably running out of time. Tokata by Diane Neumeyer, who's a photographer. Um, but uh, this, this particular work, you know, with a bounce of color um, and almost looks like a cutout form here, or abstracted form. And Broken Leaf from Nancy Azara. which to me appears, it, it, you know, there's a suggestion of almost like a heartbeat or a heart um, in this kind of natural forms. Again, um, this is a, a pochoir and hand lithography. Many of the, you know, some of the prints incorporate the um, other elements where the artist would go back in, you know, maybe have layers, you know, like they would go back in and do uh, more than one form over a form and kind of give you this layered appearance. And Lauren Ewing's um, For Magritte, many um, obviously women artists um, in, in general, but artists in particular, uh, draw from the past and draw from other artists, many of them being male because many of those artists were the ones that they might have uh, seen uh, prior to making their own work. And so For Magritte, um, she's uh, quoting both in her work, but also, um, you know, kind of almost celebrating the ideas of Rene Magritte, uh, the artist um, that the primordial, um, this is not a pipe um, image, but he often, the surrealist painter who would often have these repetitive images of, of, of heads or men with with umbrellas um, kind of descending on a space. And here it looks like factories or buildings that are descending on the people instead of people descending on uh, a city. So in some senses, she's quoting and celebrating the artist, but she's also critiquing the idea of possibly industry you know, descending on um, and, and creating modernization of, um, of this it looks to be almost a 19th century um, cityscape. So I think that's my last slide. I'm going to check. Yep, that's my last slide. Thank you so much, Shania. It's a, it's a really wonderful portfolio of images. And I think in the exhibition, seeing them all on view together, it's a really, it's a really wonderful installation too. So again, I would encourage those in the audience if you hadn't have, if you haven't had a chance to come see the show um, in person, it's up through the end of January at the museum. Um, I do want to allow some time for questions from the audience. So if anybody um, who's joining us today has questions for Shania, again, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box. Um, or the chat, if that's easier for you. I'm wondering, Shania, if you could talk about how how we acquired this portfolio, a little bit about how you decided that we needed to have this in our collection and how that happened. Well, um, it was it was twofold. I I realized um, that the the print that I mentioned earlier. Um, of Amos, uh, Amos's identity was included in that portfolio. And I thought about incorporating it into our exhibition, <laughs> you know, a little bit of economic um, <laughs> sensibility here. I realized for me to borrow this work, it might from another museum and extract it out of their portfolio of which it's a part, it might be more cost effective to actually buy the entire portfolio, <laughs> which we desperately need many of these artists in our collection because with the exception of, I think, two, we had no uh, example of works by some of really important artists um, in our own collection. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. 
I, I could buy an, we could buy an entire portfolio of women artists that we need for the cost to borrow it from another institution. Right. So that's the backstory that our audiences don't realize about the cost of <laughs> <laughs> the cost of, of, of the art business. But anyway, right. um, but anyway, the um, so when I saw the portfolio, I remembered it from seeing it at another institution. And I talked to the people at the Brodsky Center when I visited um, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and they were really nice and they had some uh, you know, they, they had some portfolios left and they were actually promoting it through an art fair. They, they showed me the portfolio and I said, this is great. Um, you know, this is a classic uh, feminist portfolio that I think we need to include. And so that's kind of how it came into the collection. Yeah, it is interesting. I think, I do think that's fascinating that it costs less to just buy the whole portfolio than to borrow and pay for shipping for one object. So that's pretty, um, Amazing, but I'm glad that it worked out in our favor this time and we got to add this incredible collection to our, our permanent collection. Um, and I would just say again that this, this installation at the museum, the Inside Look exhibition is a really wonderful chance to see some of the, um, I guess like the breadth of the types of works of art that the museum has acquired over the past couple of years. Um, I think now the total number in our collection is over 20,000 works of art, I think. It, it grows all the time. Um, but it's a really wonderful chance to kind of pull things from the vaults and see what we have in our collection that maybe isn't always out on, on view. So it's a, it's a great show. Thank you, Shania, for putting this talk together and, and for contributing such great things to the exhibition. And let me apologize for that uh, very awkward <laughs> interruption. No when, you're not, when you're not in the office or in your own space, it gets a little bit... <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that was my more of a comical portion of the, of <laughs> the presentation we're all, we're <laughs> that we can edit out. <laughs> used to, to dealing with those kind of like fun technical um, challenges at this point in our ongoing pandemic. So no worries at all. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. And thanks to all of you who, who joined us. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.